Welcome back to another episode of NHL 101. In today's episode, we're going to be going over zones, as well as how icing and offsides work in the game of hockey and the NHL specifically. All three pretty important things to understand the basic flow of a hockey game. By the way, if you do find yourself enjoying this video at any point and you like to do that kind of thing, the subscribe button down there can probably help you out. In the game of hockey, the ice is split up into three major zones. There's the defensive zone, where the goal that you're trying to protect is, the neutral zone, which is the area in the middle of the ice between the two big blue lines, and then the offensive zone, where the goal that you're trying to put the puck into is. And really, for zones, that's pretty much all there is to it, at least as far as we're concerned today. But it is an important thing to know and understand, as you will hear commentators talk quite a bit about it over the course of a game. It's also worth bringing up and going over here because those blue lines that make up the boundaries of the neutral zone on either side also serve one very big important purpose, and that is determining whether a play is onsides or offsides. For the most part, in order to put it simply, the puck needs to cross that blue line entirely into an opposing team's defensive zone before any of the players of the attacking team can cross the line. So then offsides happens whenever a member of the attacking team has both of their feet across the line in the attacking zone before the puck fully crosses the line. And that part about fully crossing the line is important because as long as an attacking player has at least part of one of their feet over that blue line at the moment you can see a little bit of white between the puck and the blue line, then they are onside, even if the rest of their body is already in the attacking zone. And I did say that the skate has to be just over the blue line pretty specifically, because even though up until recently your skate actually had to be on the ice as well as on the other side of the blue line when the puck crossed it, now the NHL has moved to allowing players to have their skate still be in the air as long as it is on the other side of that line, or directly above the line. Now it is also important that offsides or onsides is determined at the moment the puck fully crosses the line because an attacking player can go onto the other side of the blue line into the attacking zone before the puck gets there as long as they are back to the other side before the puck actually crosses the line. Then once the play, or more specifically the puck, is in that offensive zone, if for any reason it were to fully cross the blue line back into the neutral zone, then every member of the attacking team would have to get back over into the neutral zone before they could come back into the offensive zone. So that's why it is one of the main goals of a defending team in that situation to get the puck back over that line into the neutral zone, which then causes the offensive team to have to get all of their players back into the neutral zone and reset the play. The one main exception to this rule is that if a defensive player were to bring the puck out of the zone and then bring it back in, whether on purpose or on accident, any offensive players still in the zone then would not be offsides because it was the defensive team that brought the puck into the zone. Overall though, it is a fairly straightforward rule. Just make sure the puck crosses the blue line before any of your players do if you're on offense. But as any NFL fan who thinks they know what a catch is knows, things are not always as straightforward and can definitely get pretty frustrating even for what should be pretty simple rules. And I say that not because the NHL offside rule is as convoluted as what is a catch in the NFL, but more because both plays do have quite a bit of issues when it comes to instant replay and fan frustration as a result. And that's because if a play that was offsides results in a goal, then the goal doesn't count which ever since Instant Replay has entered the league and offsides became reviewable, has resulted in quite a number of seemingly exciting moments turning out, well, not to be. Leading to similar fan frustrations of waiting to see whether or not you should be excited about a goal being scored to see if the review decided it was offsides or not, to like when you score a touchdown and then they have to review to see if it was a catch or not. With the added difference of the fact that an offensive play can be going on for as much as a few minutes between when the offsides happened and when the goal was eventually scored. Which, at that point, if the play has gone on for that long, then the offsides call missed at the start of the play probably didn't make a whole lot of difference whether or not that goal was going to get scored. But that's a longer discussion for another time. As far as we're concerned right now, all you really have to understand is, once again, the puck has to cross the line before the offensive players do. And if the puck goes back across that blue line, then the offensive players also have to. And it's the struggle sometimes of the defensive players to get that puck back across the blue line that can sometimes lead to our next topic in icing. Again, at face value anyway, icing is pretty simple. If a player shoots the puck down ice and without being touched, it goes across both the center line as well as the opposing team's goal line, which is the little red line that goes all the way across the width of the ice where the goal is, then that's icing. 
First introduced in 1937, icing was brought around to prevent stall tactics from teams who would just shoot the puck across the ice constantly in order to waste time as well as slow down the opposing offense. As exemplified perfectly a few years earlier, when the New York Americans, who were protecting a lead against the Boston Bruins, iced the puck at least 50 times during the game in order to stall it out and eventually win. Of course, although frustrated by this, the Bruins took the loss like adults and moved on. Nope, just kidding, that's, that's not how the Bruins do things. No, in the next time the two teams met, the Bruins iced the puck nearly 90 times, resulting in a 0-0 tie. I mean, you have to admit, it's pretty funny. But it did also definitely help lead to the rule that is now icing. So now when a player does shoot the puck all the way across that center and opposing goal line, instead of having the other team have to go all the way back, retrieve it, and bring it back into the offensive zone, instead the play is stopped and the puck is brought back to do a face-off in one of the two face-off circles in the defensive zone of the team who iced it. Now, of course, there are some exceptions to this rule and reasons that plays that might look like icing turn out not to be. One is that if the puck does go off of a player on the other team, whether intentionally touched by them or not, and this does include the other team's goalie, then it isn't icing, regardless of whether or not it does cross both of those red lines. Also, if let's say the puck isn't moving particularly quickly down the ice and the referee determines that one of the players on the other team could have realistically gotten to it before it reached the goal line, then they might decide to not call icing. Also, importantly, icing is not called during power plays, so a team with a man disadvantage because one of their guys is in the penalty box is free to shoot the puck down the ice as many times as they want in order to kill off that penalty time. And of course, if when the puck crosses the goal line on the other side of the ice, if it's in the goal, then that's a goal and not icing. Now, to get a little bit more specific to how things work at the NHL level, the NHL uses what's called hybrid icing as opposed to automatic icing. Automatic icing is what most amateur leagues use, whether that be your adult beer league or a youth league. And that's where once the puck crosses those two lines, it's just called icing. But the NHL and most other pro leagues use something called hybrid icing. And the big difference with hybrid icing is that if a player from the team who iced the puck can get to it and touch it first, even after it's crossed the goal line, then it no longer is called icing. Now, when originally introduced, this aspect of the icing rule did lead to a lot of high-speed collisions as players from opposing teams raced to the puck to either cause or prevent an icing call. So recently, in the interest of player safety, the NHL decided to have referees determine whether or not it would be icing based on who they thought would reach the puck first when the players who are racing for it reach the hash marks around the face-off dot in the defensive zone. The other main differences with icing between your typical amateur league and how it works at the NHL level is that in your typical amateur league you can ice the puck and then go for a line change. Which, let's face it, even though that does lead to a faceoff in your defensive zone, with the shape most of us are in especially these days, that's definitely something we sorely need in those beer leagues. However, at the NHL level, they are not so lucky. When the puck is iced in the NHL, the team who iced it has to keep the same players who were on the ice when the puck was shot there for the ensuing faceoff. This also comes with the added disadvantage that the opposing team can go for a line change during that time. So then not only do you have a faceoff in your own defensive zone, but your players are likely to be quite a bit more worn out than the opposing players. It's an amendment to the icing rule that the NHL introduced in 2005 after the locked out season in order to promote a little bit more offense and prevent teams from just throwing the puck down the ice and going for a line change after having been stuck in their defensive zone for a long period of time. And then even more recently in 2017, the NHL also added that teams who ice the puck can't then take a timeout to give their players a bit of a breather before that face off. And then in 2019, they also added that the team who's going to be in the offensive zone for that faceoff can choose which one of the offensive circles they want to have the faceoff in. It is also probably worth mentioning, again, for those of you who are newer to hockey, that while both icing and offsides do kind of seem like penalties in that they stop play and result in a faceoff, much like penalties do, neither one results in a power play or one of the teams sending somebody to the penalty box. But with that, and again for now putting aside the issues and frustrations that fans have around the replay rules around offsides, that will bring us to the end of this one. So if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy this video, there are buttons for that kind of stuff down below. If you have any questions on anything we went over here or other things you'd like to see covered in the series, leave those down in the comments section. Otherwise, stay safe out there and be good to each other. Peace.